Welcome back everyone to the part two video of how to analyze a CIM, a confidential information memorandum, when looking to buy a business. And so as a quick background, I'm a Canadian investment banker focused on the middle market, primarily working with companies between $2 million in value up to about $50 million in value. And so this is really an investment banker's point of view of what do I really look for when I'm looking on behalf of a buyer at a SIM? What are the key factors to look at? And so in part one, we talked about more of the financial side and really jumping straight into the numbers. Now we're going to go more to the qualitative side of the analysis and really looking at the customers, suppliers, and the business fundamentals. So just briefly, a confidential information memorandum is really the primary selling document. And so most times you get that and that's what you use to put your preliminary offer in on a business. So it tries to tell the story of that business. And so when you're looking at different slides, there are different questions that I, I think about. And so that's what this video is trying to do. It's not trying to analyze a, a SIM specifically, but more give you common questions that you can use to then do your own analysis when reading a company-specific SIM. So as I mentioned in this part two, we're going to be talking about these first three topics, the operation overview and product service section, the customer section, and the supplier section. And these are very common slides that you would see in most SIMs across North America. So let's jump into the customer slide. So one of the primary determinants of value for any business is the quality of their customers. And the easiest way to think about the strength of a customer is to think of it in three buckets. How recurring is the sale? How concentrated are the top customers? And are there any contracts, purchase orders, or any sort of certainty around future demand in sales? Now, when you think about recurring, it's always important to think about well, if do you sell the printer or do you sell the ink? I always use that example with clients. You know, if you're selling the printer, great. You know, someone's going to buy a printer maybe once every five years or 10 years. But you have to buy the ink for that printer every three months, six months, depending on your use. So which business would you rather want to be in? A business where someone buys one, one thing from you once in five years or someone that buys something from you every three months? Probably the one that's more recurring, that they have to come back to you. So that's why recurring sales really drive value. And then from a customer contract point of view, the whole business, when you're looking to buy a business, you want to under, understand what is sustainable, what is really, what do I, what am I going to come to expect in terms of performance moving forward? And that starts with the customers and the certainty of their demand and the certainty of their purchases moving forward. Now, another key consideration is the type of end markets that they're in. And when you think about that, you say, say, for example, you're a manufacturing company and you supply companies in the defense sector. Well, the question is, where is the defense sector in the cycle of the economy? Are they at the top and at the peak and there's a big risk of spending being cut from the government and demand falling off? Or are there wars going on right now in the world? You know, governments are investing a lot in defense and military, and therefore there's probably an increase in sustainability of demand over the next coming years. So the key question for you when you're looking at the SIM is, that end market, what does demand look like at a macro level for that sector within that country that that customer is located in? And then really, are there any sort of commodity price influences that may happen? So say, for example, you supply the mining sector. Well, great. Yeah, the mining sector, there's demand right now, but the mining sector is subject to the commodity price that they're, they're going after, right? So if they're mining for gold, and gold is at an all-time high, then people have a lot of money to spend. But if gold falls down, then what happens with demand from that customer and that ultimately impacts the business you're looking to buy? So there's that balancing act of really doing a deep dive. And when you look at the customer table that they give you in the SIM, and so here's a really good example of just a sample customer table, they will break down the top you know, five or 10 or 20 customers. And sometimes they'll even suggest or specify in the SIM uh, the type of sector that that customer is in. Sometimes they don't, right? So this is, uh, you know, from one of our sims, and we try to be as detailed as we can so we can get, get straight to the point and not have a lot of people come back with a lot of questions. But oftentimes when I'm looking at other brokers' sims, I will, uh, you know, this information will not be available, and that's a follow-up question that you have to dig into as a buyer, okay? Now, uh, the other one is, under, when you understand your customer's customer, you want to make sure that you understand what influences their demand. So think of it this way. Say, for example, I'm supplying a component to a packaging distribution business who then sells packaging equipment. 
Now, in that supply chain, great. Well, packaging, you know, demand would be for food, right? So more food production, therefore more packaging demand, no issue. But that's not the case. Why does the customer's customer buy from your customer? Is that something that, again, they're buying the printer or they're buying the ink? And so in that example that I gave you with the packaging business, if it's an equipment-related company, usually that's a one-time more material purchase that happens once every couple of years as the business grows. So if it's a CapEx-related customer where demand is really tied to capital investment, then that is a little bit more this is cyclical because you know the availability of financing, the performance of the business, the ability for that business to afford that equipment, those are big ticket items that don't come around every single day. Now that's different if, say, for example, you're selling a business that sells welding wire to a manufacturer who just welds all every day, all day. That's a consumable, they're just gonna keep reordering that. So it's really important to not only think about your customer and their end market, but but the demand of your customer's customer because that really is the person that's going to write the check and it's going to go flow all the way back through the supply chain to you and, and the business that you're looking to buy. So, you know, what you're trying to do is just anticipate, is there anything that's going to change in the near future or that I need a price into my risk and structure and price that I'm going to pay for that business? Now, another one, and sometimes I hate that brokers don't do this, is they may just highlight the top five or 10 customers and put last year's sales associated with that customer and the percentage only. And that's great because that shows you concentration, but it doesn't show you the year over year performance over the last couple of years. So ideally, the broker may include that in the SIM, but other brokers don't. And so it may be good for you to understand, okay, great, I have a big customer number one here that makes up 31% of my business. But where were they at last year and the year prior? And in this example, they had there was a huge jump. So if we only showed, you know, the last 2024 numbers and we didn't show 23 and 22, you would have seen a very different picture of this business because you would have assumed, well, you know, customer one is really, really big, but that's not the case. Actually, in 23, they were much smaller. They were only $400,000 in sales relative to the 1.8. So what happened? What changed? Is that sustainable? So those are the questions that usually come up when you look at a multi-year analysis of customer sales for those top customers. And so oftentimes, again, brokers don't provide that. It's important for you to ask for that follow-up information. And then lastly, the other one that that I really like to put in our sims, but oftentimes brokers don't do it, is the AR terms. So really, what is the payment terms associated with that customer? Because different industries have different expectations. For example, automotive customers usually try to drag out payments and they'll be paid on a 90 or 120 day cycle versus retail customers. Well, you just pay via credit card. There are no terms. So what is that payment collection cycle look like for the customers that this business serves? And the reason why that that's important is because it really factors into your decision of how much working capital do you need to support the business. So in this example here, the first customer's defense, usually a big, clunky, government-funded customer, therefore the payment terms are a little bit longer at 60 days. The next one is nuclear energy, 45 days, and then here this mill writing organization is 30 days. So on average, I would say most customers in, in general are going to be in that 30 to 45 day period, but certain sectors in general just pay longer because they have the ability and the power to kind of push around suppliers and say, no, 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 you're going to wait 60 or 90 or 120 days. So it's important to get ahead and ask that question. And most brokers don't include this information in the SIM. So you need to ask that question, especially if there's a top customer. When you look at like key customer concentration like this, and we'll talk more about it in the next slide, but you know, you not only want to understand the demand to their customer's customer, you don't want to understand just the cycle, you want to understand the multi-year outlook, but you also want to understand how much it takes, how long it takes them to pay you because if you have to invest a ton of working capital to buy the inventory to carry the carry the overhead and then that customer drags out for 120 days that's a really tough customer and you're going to need a ton of capital to support that customer on an ongoing basis so that needs to be properly re reflected in the working capital target and the price of the business okay so let's pivot to another type of business so i'm just trying to touch all the different types of business in this example this is a manufacturing entity in this example this is a project based business and oftentimes that could be a contractor it could be a manufacturing entity that has multi-year projects it could be an architectural prof professional services firm type so there's a broad range of businesses where you know, not only is there customer, uh, you know, historical customers, but there's projected future customers and there's a pipeline. 
And when that happens, the, the, the benefit to that is obviously now you can kind of forecast your outlook. You can more closely say, oh, I know where revenues are going to be for the next couple of years because of this pipeline. But at the same time, these pipelines are tricky to analyze. And so it's really important to zero in on different stats. Now, I've given you the full shebang here, okay? Now, realistically, a broker is not going to give you this amount of information unless they are us, put simply, to be honest, because I don't usually see people get into this level of detail, but we've always felt the need to provide this information to our buyers so that they can get comfortable with the opportunity, and it really cuts down on the follow-up questions and, and the uncertainty, or uncertainty of them changing their mind later on in the process. So here in this example... You know, when you you when you analyze a, a business's pipeline, most people are going to give you the project, maybe the customer type, and the value of the pipeline. And they're going to say, well, the total number of customers, we have 23 projects in the pipeline, it's going to total $65 million. And there's the breakdown here. So your top customer is going to be 22%, blah, 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 to get you to 100%. But you want to go a step further and really understand how much of that pipeline has firstly been started and progress in terms of portion of completed projects versus still outstanding. And then the big one, the very big one is the expected gross margin on that work relative to what they bid at. Because most pipeline-based businesses, it's actually quite easy to get a pipeline. You know, I've seen certain business owners manipulate their pipeline, to be honest, by just bidding on work, grabbing as much work as they can, just shoving it into the pipeline and saying, well, I got $10 million worth of pipeline work. Okay, great, but what did you bid at? Did you bid at the same consistent margin that you usually run your business at? Or is it lower? Because you lowered your price to get that work to juice up that pipeline. So really the key question for you as the buyers, whenever you see a pipeline, the first question is percentage of completion, how much has already been started and completed. And so in this example, you can see most of it hasn't been completed except for a couple miscellaneous jobs. So it's there's really a good pipeline there. But not only that, but what is the expected gross margin? And can we look at what that looks like? Are you susceptible to price changes and increases? Or do you have the ability to put, you know, overwork charges and really kind of price in the additional changes in commodity prices? How firm is that contract with your customer? And the more you understand that, the more you can price in the risk associated with that pipeline. Because there's benefits, but there's also risks. Because now you've committed to the delivering $65 million worth of work in this example for really the next two, three, four years. And you know, you're tied up, you have to deliver these projects, or obviously, there's a reputational risk that you're not going to deliver as the new owner. Um, and and so the, the challenge is, okay, well, you know, am I really stepping into a good situation or a bad situation? And so, as you can see here, if, if we did have this information available, I would zero in and say, okay, if this business on average delivers about 20, 25% gross margin on the business. Anything below that, I really want to dig into and understand why is the work so low margin? What can we do to bring it up? Why did you bid on it in the first place? So right away, I'd go to this number five, industrial project, 4.5 million. It hasn't been started yet. And here the expected uh, gross margin is 9% sit down with the owner or the broker and ask, well, why is that the case? What happens here? Do you expect to potentially increase your margin on this? And sometimes there's a wink wink there with the contractor marketplace because you bid at a certain level, but then you can do all these overwork charges to get your margins up. But in other situations, there is no flexibility. So you just want to know what you're stepping into. And then lastly, you want, this is really the closing. So this business we were selling back in 2016. So in 2016, you know, where did these revenues land? How does how are these projects delivered? So you can easily factor that into your revenue forecast for the bank and your investors that you're looking to raise. So this is a very complete picture of the way I would approach a contract pipeline type business. And obviously, you're not going to get all this information right away. So it's a matter of just starting to pick and get pieces of information to put together a more complete picture of what you're stepping into. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So you know, in terms of other key questions to ask 
uh, you know, when you're looking at a business. Let's look at another example here. So this one is a distribution business. They have, you know, you know here's the top 10 customer breakdown. Uh, you know, here are the uh, customer performance from 2016 to 2019. Here's the percentage of sales. And then as well, in this example, because it's a distribution business, your gross margin in distribution businesses is everything. So really, when you're looking at a distribution type company, you should really be digging into the gross margin today, on a historical basis and where you project it to be. So what we did is we actually included information about the gross margin to say, okay, so for customer one in the last year, it was about 39.9%. Last year was 35. This for customer two is 35 versus 33. So in, in general, you can see that the average gross margin across the top 10 customers has gone up from 37 to 41%, which is a positive. So that that is that's the type of information you're looking for. Because say, for example, is going in the opposite direction. Well, why is it going in the opposite direction? Is there more pricing competition? Are customers beating us up on price? Are we losing our edge and are unable to realize on the consistent gross margin? Those all factor into your decision when it comes to deciding on the quality of that business. And so that could also be relevant for manufacturing companies, but in particular for distribution businesses. This is a really important area to focus on. And then the second one, especially for distribution businesses, is the analysis of volume versus price. So say, for example, we look at these last four years of sales, 4 million, 4, 7, 3, 8, 5, 8, okay? So in general, most of these customers have increased in sales from 2016 to 2019. The question is, how has that increase occurred? Is that by selling more? by increasing our prices and therefore inflating our sales via price increases rather than sustainable volume increases. Because the, the challenge with price increases is that the moment you do a price increase, that's great when everything is increasing. But say, for example, the market turns, demand declines, and people want to get sales. Well, the first move that most people make is maybe they start giving discounts on products. So your competitors start lowering, your price, lowering their prices, and therefore you have to follow suit so that you don't lose your customers as well. So pricing can go up quickly, but it can also go down quickly when the economy changes. So you don't really want to buy a business that has seen very consistent, strong growth simply because of price increases. You want to really zero in on how much volume has changed in the last couple of years. So this wouldn't be available in the sim, but you would follow up and ask the broker, can you tell me how much volume for the top 10 customers in the last four years has been sold based on product SKUs, based on units, whatever the case is for that specific business, but zero in on that question. That's a big one. And we do it all the time with our distribution businesses. Now, the other one is price flexibility. And so, you know, here, you really want to understand how does the quoting and sales cycle work? And, you know, what does that mean in terms of the timing? So am I bidding on project months in advance, years in advance? Or is this something that comes in, I bid on it, and I get it right away? You know, what's the cycle and the speed to which I can get customers? Because there's a good and a bad to that. The strength of that is that the longer the bidding cycle the more, you know, the more sticky it is to actually change customers because it takes so long to really switch. So you have a lot more certainty around your future medium term pipeline versus when you do that, that also limits your ability to quickly scale because you have to wait a couple months to get the next job and the next job. And so, you know, really the ability to influence rapid growth may be limited by the fact that, you know, may take longer to price jobs versus if it takes shorter to price jobs and you can quickly grab work, but then at the same time, you can quickly lose work. So that's just the importance of understanding how does a bidding cycle work. And then the last one that I always kind of add into the customer slide is understanding, and this is a big one, especially post COVID, you know, shipping costs have been very volatile in the last couple of years for most physical asset based type businesses, be it distribution, manufacturing, whatever. So understanding if it is that type of business and it has to pay shipping costs to move product around it's not really a service or an IT business well what how who pays the shipping costs firstly and how susceptible is the business to changes in ship, shipping costs because we've actually seen a couple of, of businesses where they price and I go back to this pricing flexibility comment they price six months in advance that they're going to deliver X but then shipping costs in between now and those six months have increased by 10 20 percent 
and they have to eat that cost increase and they can't pass it on to the customer. So if that is a risk, then price that in and understand where you're at in the shipping cycle as well. But vice versa, the ideal is that if you had a business where your customers, you separately price your, your shipping cost and you pass that on fully to customers and are able to pass that on, then that risk is limited. So it depends on the type of business, but we've seen multiple situations where businesses bear the risk of shipping costs, and that has actually hurt their margin in the interim whenever shipping costs you know, spike in you know, a couple months. So the last comment on the customer slide is key customers. And I would say in particular for smaller businesses, it comes with the territory. These are smaller businesses that, you know, to really kind of break to, through the small business ceiling to get to be a lower mid-market or middle market company, there's always going to be that one, two, three customers that really have been long-term uh, customers for that business that have helped spike that business and push it through the ceiling to become bigger than it, than, you know, it was 10 years ago. So, you know, I don't really look at that as saying, oh, that's just a bad thing. We should write it off completely unless you're very risk averse. And, you know, you don't really want to deal with anything related to key customers. But the way I think about key customers is that if there is a key customer relationship, in general, the price of that business is going to be lower and the structure of how you're going to structure that purchase price is also going to be more favorable for you as the buyer because you're going to need to put less cash up front relative to what is deferred and managed over time via an earnout or a deferred payment price. Uh, so, so really it depends on the type of buyer, but if you really wanted to dig into what, how, how would you analyze a key customer? The first question is a big one is the tenure and really the origin of that relationship. Is that a personal relationship between the owner of the, of the selling company and the owner of that a customer? Or is that a very, very big customer and that owner in this company deals with 12 different people, 10 different plants? Like how diverse and spread out is the customer contact relationship? If it's one-to-one, -one, there's a greater risk because if I change the owner and then the owner on the other side of the, of the table that's on the customer side isn't dealing with the owner anymore, there's a risk of that person saying like, okay, well, I'm going to start looking at other people that I want to deal with and price the work out in the marketplace. But if your business that you're looking to buy deals with 12 different plants and four different purchasing and buyer entities within each of those plants, that's spread out over, you know, 48 different people. So yeah, one or two people may, may look at the sale of that business and say, okay, that gives me the opportunity to reprice work and go back to market. But the other, others may be just too busy or they're just like, you know what, we're not going to rock the boat here. We're just going to keep buying from you. So the more spread out the customer relationship is, the the lower the risk of transition. And then as well, the tenure of the relationship, if you've been around for 30, 40 years, my key question is, how many other people have been around that long that know the processes, that know the systems, that know that entity so intimately? Because if you, if you and the business that you're looking at are really a key supplier to that business, then it's a double-edged sword. Yes, they could walk away and really hurt your business, but who are they going to go to that can deliver the same quality of support and service that you, your business is going to deliver for them because of that tenure of that relationship? So it's really important to dig in and understand the people behind the relationship, the origin, the tenureship of that relationship, and then that all feeds into this point, which is what are the switching costs? So just put yourself in the, in the, in the customer's shoes. So in this example here, this was a business that we sold. It was a manufacturing entity, and they were supplying a large multinational industrial equipment OEM, and it made up 50% of the business. And we got multiple offers on the business. We sold it. It was totally fine. Obviously, you know, sold at a lower price and with a more structure. But, you know, when we really zeroed in on this customer, we realized, A, there were three suppliers in all of North America supplying this business. B, these guys were supplying, I think, about six different factories spread out across Canada and the U.S., um, and then as well, the, the, the tenure itself was since the 1970s. So most of the buyers weren't even working for this business, whereas this supplier and the team behind that supplier, they've known their boss's boss's boss. So there's just a lot of institutional relationship and tightness there. And so the question is that we, we ask all the buyers is, imagine yourself, you were in customer number one's shoes. How would you switch, you know, $3 million worth of volume to someone else to ensure that, you know, the quality and the service and the cost really make it worthwhile. And because this was a just-in-time manufacturer that was making products on a production schedule basis, their number one pain point was making sure that the product was supplied correctly on time without fail of being late. 
that was the number one pain point for this customer. You could not be late. And these guys have been around for 40 plus years and have been supplying and have never been late for that customer. So when you think about it, if your number one pain point is never being late, and this is a supplier that's been doing this for 40 years and this has that track record, what stupid idiot would try to change that relationship and risk that. Because your number one pain point is you don't want to hold up production for this one component into this whole production schedule because you're working on a just-in-time basis. You're going to lose your job if you change suppliers. And naturally so, this business sold, and this was a couple years ago. And and so we know that you know, post-sale, the customer did not change. They continued to order from the business, and it's all steady eddy because there was this key dependence on the supplier as well. And then the last kind of two points, I could group them into one. And, you know, this depends on the type of customer. Some customers like this business here in particular, they work on production schedules. And so they had a demand forecast for the next six to 12 months. So it was quite easy to go to the seller and then the seller to, you know, garner some information from their customer to say, okay, what, what, what does demand look like for the next 6 to 12 months? And by communicating that to the buyer, we were able to reassure the buyer that, hey, listen, not only is this a customer that needs you, but it also has already factored in your supply into the next 6 to 12 months worth of work. So even if they wanted to switch, it would be a phased out approach. It wouldn't be stop and, and done within, a, you know, overnight or within a week or so because of just how integrated the supplier was into the customer's processes. So for you as the buyer, regardless of the type of business you're looking at, you want to understand what is the demand and revenue visibility for that customer and how integrated is your supply into their into their manufacturing manufacturing or delivery process is it easy to switch or a little bit complicated and therefore the switching costs are too high to make it worth switching okay so let's move on now to the supplier side so in the in now in most instances I would say if the business has key suppliers or is buying materials or commodities or whatever the case is, you know, the the SIM is also going to present a top 10 supplier uh, breakdown similar to how they would present a top 10 customer breakdown. And so similarly, there may be one, two, three years worth of historical purchases. So here, 2020, 2019, and 2018 with a breakdown of percentage based on that top supplier. So in, the, in this example, the supplier was 21%. Supplier 2 was 20%. And then th this was one of our sims, but we also then also included the payment terms because similar to the customer side, we want to understand the payment terms for the supplier side. So let's get into it. So when you're looking at the supplier uh, slide, what are the key questions you should be asking yourself? Well, the first one is, is understanding the power dynamic between you as their customer and them as your supplier. And how easily replaceable are they for you as your business? You know, do they supply very technical, specific technology, IP that is difficult to source from other people? Or is this a commodity-based type business and they're just supplying steel and you can buy steel from different types of people? You know, what is that? How easy is it to substitute that supplier? And that ultimately will influence who has the more power in the relationship and who's really going to be beholden to the other when the sale happens. Because if the, cus if the supplier has a lot of power and you sell, there may be questions around how certain is future purchases and are you going to continue to perform as a good customer and are you going to continue to pay on the same payment terms versus if that supplier's it, their, the substitution costs are very low well then you know that supplier is not really going to start asking those questions and you know kind of breaking your balls because well <laughs> they're you're buying from them so they should be pretty happy so it, it depends on the situation and who has more power in the relationship but that's the first question and that's really a business question you really want to understand how easy is it to buy from other people? Is there IP or technology? Is there something unique here? Is there maybe a rebate program or something where I get better pricing from the supplier and I can never get that type of pricing from anyone else? Because if that's the case, probably the supplier knows that and they've done that, they've done that intentionally to really lock you into that relationship because it'll be difficult to find someone else to supply at that level. So that's one of the, the couple first questions I'd be looking at. And then the second one, especially on the supplier side, especially on the supplier side, is the payment terms. Because the reality is, you know, your customers can mess around with you, but you can't mess around with your suppliers. 
customers can sit and pay you, and not pay you because they're 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 your customers and outside of you simply firing them and saying I'm not going to supply you anymore you know they are just going to pay you when they're going to pay you but on the supplier side you don't want to mess up with your supplier relationships especially if those suppliers are key and they give you something unique because in that situation you need to make sure that they're going to continue to get supply you on time and continue to extend terms to you so the next question is what are the payment terms and so in this example, this I think was a steel supply company, if I'm not mistaken, but um, most suppliers were on net 30, right? And, and so then there are certain situations where if you pay within 10 days, so here there's net 10, so net 30 with a 10-day 2% discount, well, if you pay within 10 days, you get 2% off the, the invoice, and then if you don't pay within 10, 10 days, then you just pay the invoice, but it's expected to be paid within 30 days. So when I, when I look at that, my first comment is there are certain businesses that because they're flush with cash, because they're family owned and have access cash, they will take advantage of that uh, purchase discount. And so they will simply just pay quicker and get the 2% off. So if that is the case, and I've seen this happen quite a few times in those situations, the buyer is going to say, great, I will I will pay you for the EBITDA that you have right now because your EBITDA factors in that 2% discount on purchases, which fall straight to the bottom line. But that means that there's more working capital needed to maintain that ability to pay within 10 days instead of 30 days. Now, the opposite is if you if the seller is fighting for a lower working capital target, which they usually will, then they may push and say, no, 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 well, I'm paying within 10 days, but you can really actually pay within 30 days. Fair enough. If, if I am going to pay within 30 days, then I need to factor in the fact that I'm going to lose that 2% discount on the supplier side and the supplier purchase. So it's a balancing act of understanding, okay, what are the payments? terms are we taking any discounts and if so what working capital is required to realize those discounts or if not and if you really want to leave less working capital as a seller then i need to discount the ebitda and therefore the purchase price to factor the loss of that of that discount from the supplier so that's a lot to unpack <laughs> hopefully you can follow that if not then just you know write a comment in the, in the video below but um but really that that's that's why i really zero in on the payment terms but not only that but then there's the cash conversion cycle so say for example i have to pay my suppliers within 30 days but my key customer Customer, and if you go back to that first slide, my key customer is 40% of my business and they have to they pay me within that 60 days. So now I have to already pay my supplier and still wait another 30 days for me to actually realize the sale and collect on the AR for my customer. That means that my I need more working capital on the balance sheet. And there may be situations where my customer may be even late in paying me and I need to be comfortable in writing that out maybe for 75 days instead of 60 days. So these would be the questions you'd be asking yourself when it goes back down to the, to the key comment in an analysis of saying how much business does this how much working capital does this business need? Because there are certain buyers that don't want to deal with working capital heavy businesses because of the financing risk and the cash conversion risk that exists from the difference between the supplier terms and the customer AR terms, okay? So another question to ask is the lead times. So depending on where your customer is located, do you buy, you know, if you uh, place an order with a supplier, is that fulfilled within 24 hours, within one week, within two weeks, or within three months? We're working with a business right now where all their key suppliers are based in Asia. So they have to De forecast their demand and the supply that they need three months out so that they can buy it, put it on a container ship, ship it overseas and bring it back to Canada. So the lead times also influence the amount of inventory that you have to carry. Because if your customer can supply your inventory within one or two days, then really you probably need to carry less inventory. But if you have long lead times, then your inventory is higher. So that also factors into your working capital and just understanding the cycle of the business. Another one is the historical price increases and decreases. So similar to the questions of volume versus price on the customer and growth side, you want to understand what type of price increases have been seen from the supplier side in the last couple of years and how has the business been able to either pass on those price increases and the speed in which they've been able to pass on those price increases. So the question I'd ask the broker or the seller is, well, you know, for your key suppliers here, let's just zero in on these two, these two key suppliers which make up 40% of your purchases. What, when was the last time they increased the price? How much did they increase the price by? And how long did it take for you to then take that price, factor that into your sale, and then pass it on to the customer? Did you have to eat a price increase for one week, two weeks, three months, six months, one year? And that will really give you an understanding, again, of the ability to 
pass on price increases and the ability to maintain gross margin. The quicker you can pass on a, a, a price increase, the more sustainable that gross margin, the more steady the financial profile of that business is. Okay. And then the last one, and this one, I'm just looking at a deal right now. Like just, you know, like yesterday, I was looking at a deal, interesting little business, very niche distribution company. It was a broker put together this 40 page fluff piece. And the one of the most important questions was a Canadian distributor that was ordering supply from the US. They totally skipped over well, what is the foreign exchange percentage of purchases? And that's a very key stat, especially for Canadian-based businesses, where if we order a lot from the U.S., how much of my purchases are in U.S. dollars and how much of my sales are in U.S. dollars? And that will influence how much of a natural hedge exists in FX. Because say, for example, I buy 100% in U.S. dollars and sell 100% in Canadian dollars, that's the losing end of a, That's a weak business, very weak business in terms of, of gross margin. It exists and people will make a perfectly fine living. But you have to factor that into your price and how you analyze the future performance of the, of the foreign exchange rate. Because now I'm buying all in a high, heavier, more expensive US dollar. I sell in the Canadian dollar, and then I have to convert those Canadian dollars that I've sold back into US dollars to buy more. And if the US dollar continues to increase, then I'm paying more for my supply, but I may not be able to pass on that price increase to the customer, and therefore my margin compresses. Now, it's the flip side. Say, for example, you sell 100% in U.S. dollars, but you only buy 100% in Canadian dollars. That's the best case scenario because now every time the U.S. dollar increases, well, now you get additional margin, margin, margin like on the dollar that you sold because you're converting that U.S. dollar back into your home currency of the Canadian dollar. So this is more relevant for Canadian businesses, but it could be as well for the U.S. business if you're supplying, uh, if your suppliers are in Europe and you're buying in euros and you're trying to convert that into, into U.S. dollars. So this is probably one of the bigger questions that I would zero in on on the supplier side to say, okay, where are these suppliers located? How many of these suppliers are ordering in my domestic currency versus our foreign currencies? And how does that com compare to my sales profile as well? Okay, now let's talk about key, key suppliers. So on the key supplier side, like a key customer, I, my eyes is worse than a key supplier, but key suppliers can also dictate the performance of a business greatly. So in this example, this is another live example, this was a distribution business, and it was really a master distributor. Like they had, their number one supplier was 80% of their business. And so they were constantly reordering from this one brand. Now they had a contract in place, but that contract had a renewal term. So a lot of buyers really zeroed in on, on that. And then by the way, this was a Canadian based business and to bring it back to FX, all of the purchases were in USD. So the 80%, so virtually I would say about like 85, 87% of the purchases were in USD across all suppliers versus their Canadian, the, they were all 100% sales. So, you know, at the end of the day, that from an FX point of view, that also factored into the, the discussion. But when you look at this business here and you look at any type of key supplier, very similar to the key customer, your, key, your first question is, what is the origin of that relationship and why does that relationship again exist? Is this a former in-house division that's been spun out and now is really just distributing on behalf of the parent company? Is this something that has been around for 40 years or did they just recently pick this up in the last five years? And then really, who are you dealing with on the supplier side? You know, so in this example, do you know the ownership group? Do you know just the, the uh, sales rep? Who do you really know there? Because the more relationships that you have with that supplier, the more that relationship is obviously spread out and you can pull different strings to get what you want as a customer. Now, the, the key question here is how much of your purchases make up the supplier's sales. So very similarly to the way you think about the customer concentration side, just remember that now if you're buying a lot of supply from, the, from, from them, how much do you make of their customer list? Are you a 40% customer? Are you a 10% customer? Are you an 80% customer? Ideally, if you're about the same size and you're selling, if you're, and you're buying from them, well, then you're also probably going to be very key to them. So, you know, they're probably not going to play around because it's kind of just this, you know, Mexican standoff here where, you know, if I shoot, I'm going to shoot you, you're going to shoot me and we're just dead. You know, we're going to screw this whole thing up and, we're, and it's better to work together instead of trying to play and rock the boat. But say, for example, you're a mid-sized business and you're ordering from a large multinational, well, maybe you're only 2% of their customer list, but they make up 80% of your supplier list. 
Well, in that situation, then there's probably a, a greater risk for you. And you have to understand why would they continue to supply you? How is there a potential risk of them using their supplier power to your advantage? Because they make up 80% of your supplier list. Well, why are you in that situation in the first place? Is that simply because no one else can supply whatever you buy from those guys? Is there an IP? Is there a contract? What exists? What locks you into that relationship? And so the first question would be for the buyers, can I diversify that? And if not, then really, how do I ensure that that supplier does not take advantage of me? That doesn't mess around and start increasing pricing and, and, and too quickly and that I can't pass on those price increases because that does happen. You know, the reality is if they know that you're, if they're, they're a key supplier to you, well, they're not going to think as hard about put, putting through a price increase because they know, well, where, you, where else are you going to go or 80% of your business? So there's, there's that balancing act there. And usually the bigger the supplier concentration, as I mentioned in this example, where the guy's 80% of, of, of this guy's business, well, it was, there was actually a contract behind this. They, you know, they were an exclusive distributor in Canada for this brand. And so majority of the, of, of the, of the business was centered around this brand with a few miscellaneous suppliers, but really there was a contract there. And so if there is a contract behind a key customer, or there's some sort of paper, you know, you as the buyer of that business need to analyze how, when did that contract come into place? Is this a recurring contract that's been around for 30 years? Or is this a new contract that re was recently secured five years ago? And then what is the term behind that contract? Is this contract going to stay on for two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 12 years? What does that look like? In this example here, it was a 12 year contract that they were two years into. So they had 10 years left on the contract and there was, there was less of a concern on this key supplier risk. Funny enough, the nervous Nellies of the buyers, they were thinking, well, listen, I'm going to buy this business. Business, and I may hold on to it for five, six years. So when I go to sell this business, now there's only going to be four years left on the contract. So do I get penalized for that from a value point of view? Now I'm taking you out of your problem, but now I'm going to have a problem five or six years down the line when the, the term of the contract is only going to be four years left. And the next buyer is going to ask me the same question and I can't exit at the value that I want to. So these are the questions that you kind of have to think about when there's a contract in place and how easy it to renew. So there's always a way you can find risk. At the end of the day, it's about mitigating it through purchase price structure, okay? So let's move on to the last pillar of this part two video. So we talked about customers, suppliers. Now let's talk about the business itself. And so I'm just, I was, I was thinking of how do I communicate, how do I like, teach you guys about analyzing a business when I don't know the business that you're looking at. So I'm going to give you really the high level of framework to which I usually think about a business. And so one of the good ways, one of the best models I found, because it doesn't have to be super complex. You know, there's a lot of people that like try to, you know, analyze in different like financial models and then, you know, apply industry research and, you know, go from a macro point of view. Like I really love the Porter's five forces model. I think it's a very simple model that really communicates very clear, clearly the power of that business with its customers, suppliers, and the competitive environment. And then it will really essentially address at a very high level what where that business stands in terms of strength. Is it a very weak business in one area? Is it pretty well uh, diversified and therefore there's no real one weakness? Or does it have a really, really good strength that maybe may warrant a purchase price premium? So I find that this model is very relevant and a good backup is really just doing a SWOT analysis, a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, you know, four-way quadrant, just spelling out exactly what the strengths and weaknesses are. And then, you know, comparing that to the Porter's five forces model to really have that as a backup. But let's talk about this model. So there are five buckets to the Porter's five forces. The first one is the competitive rivals. Second is potential new entrants. Third is supplier, fourth is customer power, and the fifth is the threat of substitutes. And so funny enough, I put this as the last uh, topic in this video because we've kind of already touched on all of these through the customer and supplier slides. We've talked about switching costs. We've talked about pricing power and who can pa pass on the price increases. I talked about competition and if they lower prices, do you have to follow suit? We've talked about the threat of substitutes. So this should not be new because we've already applied some of these key questions on the customer supplier side, but that's why this 
Porter's Five Forces kind of covers everything, and, and it really just supplements your analysis. So just to very quickly go into this, the way I'm going to uh, do this is going to walk you through each of the five uh, for, five forces, I'll help you understand what are the key questions to ask, and then I'm going to go into the next slide and compare two live examples, two businesses that we've worked with, and apply the pi for Porter's Five Forces to each of those businesses. So looking at the first one, the competitive rivals, this really focuses on the number of competitors in that sector. You know, so if you are a local company within your state or province, and there are five suppliers that can do what you do, or 500 suppliers that do what you do, the difference in the number of competitors is really going to influence your ability to grow. Because the more people that are that are out there to do what you can do, then the more competition there is for the same level of work. Versus the less the competition, the question is how quickly is the industry growing relative to the number of competitors in, in the sector. But really, you want to focus in to say from a competitive point of view, just go on Google Maps and look up the type of business or the type of service that you're buying and see who else is out there. Is it a 30 names that pop up within your local 50 kilometer radius or is it five names? You know, the difference is really going to help you understand how competitive the marketplace is. The second one is potential new entrants. So maybe there aren't any competitors today or there's less competitors today, but how easy or hard is it to get into your business? So in a good way to think about it is that typically an asset heavy business, if it's a manufacturing company, a trucking business, you know, uh, you know, something where there's, you know, you have to spend half a million, a million, $2 million to get the equipment and the facility set up to get, get yourself in that business, then the, the threat of new interest is more limited because now someone has to spend $2 million to get to where you are to compete in the field that you're competing in. Now, the opposite case is say, for example, there really isn't any capital spend. Maybe you just got to buy a truck and that's it. So you just get in a truck and you start moving things. So for example, moving companies, a moving company outside of just some commercial insurance, which isn't really that hard to get in and moving, there's, there would be just the people element and there would be one or two trucks and that's it. So the threat of new entrants in the moving industry is probably very high versus in a very specialized sector where you have to spend millions of dollars on a specialized a facility, probably the threat of new entrants is limited. So those are the key things to think about, the, the cost to get in and also the regulatory requirements. So say, for example, a business has a specific license that takes, you know, either a track record, capital, or really history that has been grandfathered in. So I'll think of a live example right now. So we're working with a manufacturing business that supplies the defense sector. In the defense sector, there is a controlled goods certification required that you have to pass. And it's really a quality audit and a cybersecurity audit to confirm that you can supply sensitive government contracts related to the military because you have the systems uh, insurance and the facility and the team in place to meet that. Well, the cost of getting that is probably 12 months worth of work and changing the systems and processes, plus, you know, some investment in UIT resources if you wanted to upgrade the business to that level. So it takes at least a year to get through that. So the, the, the regulatory barrier is that, you know, to pass all those tests and get there, it's going to take you a year. So do you want to do that? Or do you want to go after something else? Do you want to go after another sector? Hence the reason why businesses that have specialized certi certifications, regulatory requirements, or approvals, they typically trade for a little bit more in value because they're insulated. There's less competition in that marketplace. Okay. Now going to supplier power, we talked about this already, but the key questions are, what are the switching costs? You know, if I have a couple key suppliers, can I easily interchange them and find someone else to supply me the same quality product or service at the same price or a cheaper price? Or is it really hard for me to find a, someone similar? Is there some sort of unique IP that I have to deal with one person that I can't move away from? And how many suppliers are there? Are there five out there in, in the local marketplace? Are there 50? You know, what does that look like? Can I go and offshore this? Can I go and buy from, from afar? Does this business allow me to do that? Or the offshoring risk is limited and therefore suppliers have a little bit more power because they know they, that they can't be offshored. So really understanding the power of the supplier because the more power they have, the more they're able to pass price increases onto you without you pushing back and saying, oh, no, no, if you push a, put through an increase, I'm going to start shopping and going to someone else. They're not going to have that fear because they know they have the power. 
Similarly, on the customer side, the question is how price sensitive is that cu- is that customer? You know, if you pass on a price increase, will that trigger the customer and essentially make them go to someone else and say, okay, well, you're, I'm not going to pay an extra 5%. Let me see if I can find someone else to do this. How easy is it for them to switch and find someone else that can do what you're doing, that can supply what you're supplying? And that's why most buyers really prefer B2B companies versus B2C. Because in B2C, business to consumer type relationships, well, that's a retail type relationship. There's probably a lot more competition than in B2B type specialized in industries where there's a couple of suppliers, but not as many as, as on the retail side. So that's why it's funny enough, like a lot of business buyers really want B2B because of this very reason that the customer power is more limited in a B2B environment versus a B2C environment. And then the last one is the threat of substitutes. So really, when you look at the product and or service that you supply, how comparable in price and quality is the next best alternative? So you're really comparing what you can do for your customer versus what the next person can do. And so if you have IP, then you really have good supplier power in your customer's eyes because now they can't leave you. You know, you have IP, you have a trademark. Someone wants to deal with you because you are Coca-Cola and I want to buy from Coca-Cola. But using Coca-Cola as an example, Pepsi is right there. So there is a very close alternative in terms of Pepsi. So the quality is probably not too different. The price is not too different. Therefore, there is a real threat of being uh, of the substitute. Now, if I'm delivering a very unique software technology in a niche B2B sector, it's unlikely that there'll be someone that is very similar to me that can deliver at the same price and the same type of service. I found my niche, I found my service, and therefore I have a better strength of a business because there's not a lot of substitutes. So the customer can go and shop me around and, and beat me up on price because there's not a lot of people that can do what I do. So when you think about a business in these five quadrants, it's going to to trigger all these questions that ultimately trickle down to your customer and your supplier analysis and help you decide whether the quality of that business is good or not. So now let's apply the Porter's Five Forces model to two businesses. And I picked these purposefully because one is a B2B gas station repair company. So these guys would actually repair the equipment and the gas station asset for the gas station owner not the customers, but the owner of that gas station. On the flip side, the high-end spa is something where you're just delivering spa services, massages, facials, stuff like that to regular customers, retail customers. So when you look at it and you say, let's talk about the first one, the comparable rivals. What is the competitive environment out there? What's the competitive rivals that exist? Well, the first question is how many are there, the number of competitors, and really the type of differentiation that exists between those competitors? Well, in the gas station repair business, can you think of a gas station repair business that you know? Do you know any names? Go on Google and try to find someone out in your local marketplace. There aren't many. And so here in Ontario, there's probably like five, seven, maybe. Uh, So really the number of competitors is limited. Now that also means that you know, in this marketplace, because it's gas station, the little growth rate is low. So there's not a lot of people wanting to come into the space. And But at the same time, because of that, there's less competition. And so the price, the threat of price declines of prices just falling because of competition is more limited. Now on the high end day spa, There's a bunch of day spas. You can always find them here. And so what's really the difference outside of a little brand and a little personal relationship? There's good growth because people want to spend money on themselves. Obviously, insurance pays for these things. But really, the service and the price are very interchangeable amongst, you know, all the high-end day spas. You can think of a very close, similar competitor down the street or, you know, a couple minutes away by car that can just take that business away. So competition is higher on that side. Now, on the potential new market entrance, in the gas station business, there's regulatory requirements. You have to be licensed. You have to have a pump mechanic license. There's three different levels. It takes three years to get that license. You have specialized insurance. 
and you also have very highly technical labor. So if you have the labor, you know, it's really hard to find five guys that also have that specialized experience and have that pump mechanic license to be able to compete and build the similar size business. So because it's a very technical niche regulated industry, the ability to quickly scale and, and compete with that in, the incumbent players in the space is limited, and therefore the threat is very low. Now on the day spa side, you know, there are many people coming into the space. Now, there's some that are more fancy than others, but to spend a little bit more money to get that same level of fanciness, I don't know if that's a word, I think it is, fanciness, then really there's less less barriers to entry. You can just spend to get to the same level. There's nothing really unique about it. Therefore, there's low barriers to entry and the threat of new competitors is high. Now, on the supplier side, the challenge with this business here is actually they only have three key suppliers. So the supplier power is actually very high. They can't go in order for many people because there's three uh, suppliers that supply all the gas station equipment in, in, in North America. So it's really hard for, for you as the customer to that supplier to try to push them around and try to negotiate price and lower them. You're actually more beholden to them and what they do. If they introduce new price increases, you have to deal with it. You can't really push back. Now, there's little supplier pricing power on the high-end day spa because who are the suppliers? I mean, it's your labor pool. You know, it's maybe some massage oils and, you know, like the massage equipment, which is one time, but there's very limited pricing power and majority of those miscellaneous consumables and equipment there's a lot of brands out there you can go to china and buy it off alibaba so the price power is very limited for the supplier and therefore you have more power than your supplier on the high-end day spa now on the customer power side it's a medium you know because the customer needs to repair their equipment, there is a legal element in terms of certifying the equipment. So the regulatory environment really plays into it and encourages customers to spend money. But at the same time, these customers, the profit margins and the strength of the customer is limited. And that's one thing I didn't mention. But if you were to think about your customer's customer, who are those customer's customers and what margin does your customer have to deal with their customer? So if you're, if you're selling into a business, say, for example, that has 40% gross margins versus a business that has 10% gross margins, who has more money to spend on your, your product? Well, probably the company that has 40% gross margins. So the weaker your customer is in terms of the margin profile, probably the, the tighter the budget is to spend money, and that does actually limit your customer power. Yes, you can push them around, but there's a certain point where they just don't have the money to actually spend on your product and or service. And we saw that in this business where gas stations, there's threat of EVs, there's a lot of things happening right now in the C-store space, which is really actually limiting your ability to have customer power because yes, they have to come to you. Yes, there's not a lot of competitors in the space, but they just don't have the money. Now on the price sensitivity side for the for the spa side, well, number one, it's highly competitive. Therefore, customers are very price sensitive. And if you increase your massage rates by $50 an hour, well, people are going to, a lot of people are going to walk away and just go down the street and find someone else to do that same massage. So it's really easy to compare. And therefore, customers have a lot more power over you. Yes, you have power over your supplier as a spa, but you also don't have a lot of power because your customer has a lot of power over you. So again, that's a delicate balance of you're kind of stuck. You can't really push incre price increases too much because suppliers would or your customers will just walk away and then the last one is threat of substitutes so in this example the gas station repair business everyone delivers the same service so it's not like they're it's not like they're unique there's no ip there's no real specific technology anyone that's in this space because even though there's less competition the people that are in this space can do what you do so the threat is minimal but i would consider it kind of medium the medium risk is that the next guy can do what you do, and if he lowers his prices and grabs that business, then you're stuck because they can just do that. They can actually substitute you. So price is still an element of competition in this business, and it's the same thing with the high-end spa. There's a lot of competition. The threat of being substituted by another supplier is very high. Therefore, you don't have a lot of uh, power. And that's why like these two kind of buckets, the customer power and the threat of substitute, both of them are, are, are related because usually if you have a lot of uh, a low customer power and the, cu the customer has a lot of power over you, then, then probably there's a lot of substitutes available and vice versa, okay?
So that's that's it for part two. <laughs> Again, another long one here, but hopefully that really helped you understand how I would think about analyzing customers and suppliers and also the business model. And then we talked about a lot of different examples, but obviously there are going to be specific situations that some of these questions are relevant and some of them are not going to be. So if you do have any follow-up questions, you can book a call with me. You know, if you go in the video link description, you can click on the calendar uh, link and there you can book a one hour session for me to kind of coach you through a sim to provide my comments to provide some questions that you can go back to the broker with and then if you have any questions or comments you can either comment below in the video or you can just uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, I'm available there and lastly if you have anyone if you are in Canada or you have any relatives that are in Canada that own a business and are thinking of selling please do think of us we are very busy we sell about 14 to 15 companies a year right now and uh, always looking to help more business owners out so thank you all for watching the video and have a great day bye